Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church for our online service. Once again, we're in week three, but we are excited that you are here to join us today. We want to remind you of a few things before we start our service. First of all, we want you to comment. We want you to share. Include as many people as you can in our service time each week. You can do that on our Facebook page. You can also share our webpage. It's hbclebanon.com as the sermon will be posted there as well. A couple of other things. Uh, as we continue to try to be the hands and feet of Christ during this difficult time, we want you to know that we are still available to assist. If you know anyone in our church family that needs any kind of assistance with groceries or whatever the case may be, please contact one of the pastors, one of the deacons, and we would love to take the opportunity to continue to help and to serve. Finally, on our webpage, if you will go to hbclebanon.com, click on the resources tab, there's a lot of information there that you can use throughout the week or during Sundays, whenever it may be. We have the Right Now Media information that you can use, a lot of great resources there. We also have some kids' activity pages and some, some things that they can use during the sermon, note pages that they can use. So we invite you to go to the resources tab at hbclebanon.com. Once again, we are excited that you've joined us here at Heritage, and we just participate or we anticipate you joining us and participating throughout our service today. This morning as we prepare to worship together in our homes, I want to read a passage of scripture to you that I hope would encourage you this morning as we sing. It's found in Psalm chapter 118, starting in verse 13. It says this, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has given me victory. Songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. And these are definitely uncertain times. There's a lot of unknowns. But what we know to be true is that we fight from victory because God will always be victorious. And so this morning as we sing, remember his strength, remember his power, remember his presence is there with you today right where you're at. So let's sing together. Let's worship the Lord.
Well, good morning, Heritage, and welcome to our online service this morning. Uh, Our text this morning is going to be Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to start there in verse 36. And as you're turning, uh, there are just a couple things I want to say. One, it's been so encouraging to see the engagement that we've had online. I've loved seeing pictures of people in their living room with their Bibles open, talking about how the Lord has used the messages. And and it's, it's unfortunate that we can't meet together, but I'm so thankful that the Lord has given us this platform that we can use. And so thank you for being here and tuning in. Also, I want to let you know about some resources that we have. There are sermon notes available to you. You can find them on our website, as well as family discussion questions that we uh, really encourage you to use afterwards to continue the message, to apply it to your family, and to just let the Lord continue to move uh, as, we, as we open His Word. So uh, Matthew chapter 26, again, we're going to start there in verse 36 and go down through verse 45. Uh, As we do, uh, I want to tell you the story of a famous picture. Many of you have seen it. In fact, we're going to try and get it up on the screen right here for you to see. It's a story of a woman uh, being kissed by a man in Times Square. And uh, it's a famous photograph. It was right after VJ Day, the day America defeated Japan to end World War II. And there was such a great celebration that as the story goes, people were crowding in the streets, going around, celebrating this when a sailor came, took a woman who he didn't know, bent her down, and gave her a kiss. And as it appeared for the first time in 1945 in Life magazine, the caption read this, In New York's Times Square, a white-clad girl clutches her purse and skirt as an uninhibited sailor plants his lips squarely on hers. This was an incredible celebration. And as we think about celebration one, I'm looking forward and I'm already anticipating the celebration of when we get to come back together in person. It's going to be a great time. I don't encourage you to grab a random woman and kiss her on the lips, but it's going to be great when we get back together. But uh, in the meantime, we do have an incredible celebration coming up next Sunday with Easter Sunday. It's the greatest day on the Christian calendar because we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, that he was victorious over sin and death and hell, and we get to celebrate all of those things upcoming next 
Sunday. But as we think about that, the reason why this photograph was so iconic and the reason why still it resonates with people is because this amazing celebration came after one of the darkest times in our nation and in the world's history. As the people celebrated, they celebrated the fact that there was no more war, no more killing, no more death, and this man grabbed this woman because the darkness was gone and the celebration had come. And as we come to the text today, we're anticipating Easter next week, but we need to remember we're not quite there. And sometimes as Christians, I think that as we get into the Easter season, it's really easy for us to anticipate the celebration, but we forget about the darkness that came before. And so as we sang today, we sang about the cross. We sang about how Jesus gave his life. And we, as we think about the cross, we need to remember the darkness that was the cross as Jesus gave his life for us, as he offered himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. We need to feel the weight of that. And the only way that we're going to be able to truly celebrate next Sunday is if we feel the weight of what Jesus did and why Jesus had to die on the cross. And that's what we're going to do today as we look at Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start in verse 36, reading about Jesus before he goes to the cross in the Garden of, of Gethsemane. Now, before we jump into this text, again, this is the last week of Jesus' life. And of course, today as you're watching this, it's Palm Sunday. At this point, Jesus has already come. He's already entered in Jerusalem. They've already put down the palm branches and praised his name, singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus has spent time in the temple that week, leading up to what he knew would turn into a a mob and a crucifixion at the end of the week. And before he's handed over to the authorities, he now comes to this point in the Garden of Gethsemane and prays this incredible prayer that I believe is going to teach us something this morning. So I want to read the story starting in verse 36 of Matthew chapter 26. It says this, Then Jesus came with them, so he came with his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So Jesus is going to pray. He knows what's coming. He tells his disciples to stay there and wait for him. And in verse 37, it says, taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, think about Jesus for a moment. Think about what he's going through. He already knows, he's already predicted that when he goes to Jerusalem, the leaders and the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Romans, all of them are going to conspire together to crucify him. He's told his disciples that three times already. He knows what's going to come. And as he faces it in the frailty of of his humanity, he is sorrowful and troubled. And he goes into the garden with the weight of what he's going to face on his mind. In fact, the Gospel of Luke in this same story, it says that he was so troubled that he began to sweat drops of blood. As as, as we think about the cross, we need to not forget the agony that it caused Jesus. And we see that further in the next verse. It says this in verse 38, he said to them, that is he said to Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he said, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. I just want us to pause for a moment and feel the weight of what Jesus felt. And as, as often as the, in the case in Scripture, when it comes to reading Scripture, sometimes things just pop out to you that you haven't seen before. And this was several weeks ago I was reading this text when I realized something. I realized that Jesus was sorrowful in this moment. He was deeply grieved in this moment, even to the point of death, even though he knew that after dying, he would rise again. In other words, think about this. Even though Jesus knew Easter was coming on Sunday, It still grieved him to the point of death that he was going to have to undergo the weight of the cross. And as we think about Jesus, as we think about what he was going to face, it's so important that we feel the weight of it, that we feel the weight of what he felt. And of course, that's really impossible. We can't obviously know what Jesus felt. There's a a song that says this, that when it comes to the cross, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Only Jesus knows the weight and the agony of what he felt on the cross. But we can try the best we can to understand when it says that he was deeply grieved to the point of death. And as we look at this text, we might ask, well, why did it grieve him so deeply? And a major part of that is because he knew that on the cross for the first time in all eternity, he was going to feel separation from the Father. He was going to feel the weight of sin upon his shoulders, that the fellowship that he had felt with the Father would be disconnected, that God would pour out his wrath on Jesus as a sin substitute. And as Jesus looked to the cross, he knew what was to come. And he tells them, I'm deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. 
This is a plea to the disciples. Stay with me for these last moments. And it says in verse 39, going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And there are a few different things in this prayer that I think are important for us to notice. The first is that even in this moment of agony, Jesus continues to pray, my father. And we talked about this last week, that God is our heavenly father, that he loves us, that he knows us, that he cares for us. And as as Jesus is praying, he appeals to his father. He says, my father, the one who knows my heart, the one who sees my agony, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And as Jesus refers to the cup here, he's referring to to an Old Testament symbol that's used often to refer to the wrath of God. That when it comes to sin, God's anger, God's wrath is built up and he looks at sin and God must be just and punish sin. And so Jesus here is referring to the fact that he must drink the cup of God's wrath. That God's wrath is going to be poured out and either Jesus would come as a sacrifice in our place to take that punishment for us or else God's wrath would be poured on us. Jesus knows that and so he says, my father, if it's at all possible, let this cup be taken from me. And we can understand, can't we, that Jesus doesn't want to feel separation from his Father, that Jesus doesn't want to go undergo the agony, the shame, the torture, the humiliation, all of it, of the cross. And so he prays, my Father, please let this cup, if it's at all possible, pass from me. Yet, he says, not as I will, but as you will. And here we see the heart of Jesus. We see that his His obedience is at the forefront of his mind that no matter what it costs him, he wants to be obedient to his father. That no matter what it costs him personally, he wants to follow the father's will. And so he continues, not as I will, but as you will. And then in verse 40, it says this, he came back to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he asked Peter, so you couldn't stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. And in this moment, we see a a, a very strict dichotomy, don't we, between the obedience of Jesus, even to the point of death, and these disciples who Jesus asked just for a little while to stay awake to pray for me, and yet even after that request, they fell asleep. We see here that these disciples, like us, are undeserving. We don't deserve the grace of God. We don't deserve the mercy that He's given. And yet, what does Jesus do? He goes back, he prays a second time, and he went and prayed, my father again, if this this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. His heart is to do the will of the father. And I want us to see something right here. The second time he says, if this cannot pass. And can can we all understand that surely if there was any other way, if there was any other way besides torture, if there was any other way besides sacrifice, if there was any other way than Jesus standing in our place, then surely the father would have provided But here's what we see. Jesus goes again, and again he found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. In verse 44, after leaving them, he went away again, prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more, if it's at all possible. But the fact is, it wasn't possible. There was no other path but the cross for our salvation. And as Jesus prayed, he prayed again, not my will, but your will be done. And he went back to the disciples. He said to them, are you still sleeping and resting, seeing, see, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. And later the text tells us Judas comes with a crowd. They arrest him. He undergoes a mock trial. He's brought before the Jewish leaders. He's brought before the Roman leaders. He was killed by the Romans as he was nailed to a cross, tortured, beaten, bruised, humiliated. Jesus underwent the worst possible death. And he did it as a payment for us. And so today, as we think about what Jesus did on our behalf, I want us to consider the cross. We're going to have much to celebrate a week from now, but right now we need to feel the depth of it. And so I want us to to think about the cross. And today I have three meditations, three things that I want us to consider as we think about the cross. And the first is this, the cause of the cross. The cause of the cross. Why is it that Jesus had to die? 
And the simple answer to that is Jesus had to die because of sin. Adam and Eve sinned. The Bible says that the first man and the first woman, they sinned against God. God gave them explicit instructions, clear directions. Do not eat from the fruit of this tree. And in their rebellion, in an act that was essentially saying, God, we don't want to follow you. We don't want you to be Lord of our life. Adam and Eve sinned. And in that moment, death entered the world. And God knew, God knew before Adam and Eve sinned, but God knew after Adam and Eve sinned that he would have to provide redemption, that he would have to provide a sacrifice. And we might think, well, that's not fair. Why is it that that we have to pay the price for Adam and Eve's sins? But here's what I want to pose to you. Can any one of us blame Adam and Eve? Can any one, one of us say it was their fault? Have we not had it our own sin? And as we think about this, I want you to think about a moment, the sin in your life. The Bible says that we've all sinned, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And I want you to think for a moment about the the pain and destruction that your sin has caused. And this isn't fun to think about. It's not something that makes us, you know, have a high degree of self-esteem. But the fact is this, that we've all sinned and the sin that we have committed has made it difficult, has added so much pain to the people in our lives. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to think about how my sin impacts my wife. I don't like to think about how my sin impacts my kids. I don't think about how, like to think about how my sin impacts the church that I've called to serve. But the fact is this, that our sin has consequences. And just like Adam and Eve's sin was an open act of rebellion against God, the same is true of ours. That when we sin, it's us saying to God, God, I don't want you to be Lord of my life. I know you made me. I know that I owe you my very life because the breath of my lungs belongs to you. But God, I am going my own way. I am doing my own thing. And I want you to think about sin for a moment from God's perspective. You see, when we think about sin, we can really ignore most sin in the world, can't we? We look on the news, something bad happens, a child is abused, someone cheats, someone lies, someone steals. We see it and we can just kind of look at it and just move on. But consider for a moment that God doesn't have that luxury. And even though we see just a tiny fraction of all the sin that's committed, think for a moment that all sin, all human sin is before God. All of our sin is laid bare before Him. And not only does He see it as an act of rebellion against Himself, He sees the pain, the devastation, the destruction. He sees every child abused. He sees every spouse that cheats. He sees every time a man's eyes go after a woman. He sees every lie. He sees us gossip. He sees all the things that we do. And He looks at it and He sees the pain and the devastation. And it is repugnant to God. And we think about God, as we think about ourselves, we can ignore sin, but God cannot. Because God is holy. And this is so important for us to remember. We oftentimes downplay the holiness of God. We like to think about the love of God. We like to think about the mercy of God. But the fact is this, that God is holy. And God is holy in and of Himself. He cannot possibly be otherwise. God is holy. The Bible says in the Old Testament over and over again that God is holy, holy, holy. That is, He is the greatest degree of holiness that we can possibly imagine. And because God is holy, He has a holy aversion. He has a holy disdain for all sin and the pain and the suffering that sin causes. As we think about the cause of the cross, the cause of the cross is sin. If there were no sin... Jesus would not have had to die. But because of sin, the price had to be paid. Now, I want us to think about that for a moment. Because as we think about the cause of the cross, the cause of the cross is sin. But the cost of the cross, as we're about to see, the cost of the cross is nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's a famous atheist, his name is Richard Dawkins, who says this, isn't the cross just divine child abuse? Isn't it God, this angry God, just taking it out on his own son? And he says, is this, is this a God of true justice? If, if, a, if a judge said to a father, you've got to take the price out on a son, wouldn't we say that that judge is unjust? But I want us to think about this for a moment. This is not a God who is off the hinges. This is not a God who is out of control, who's gone just to beat his son so that someone else can go free. No, this is a God who knows that nothing else but payment for sin will satisfy You see, in God's holy nature, He knows that a price has to be paid, that all of the sin and the suffering of the world has a consequence. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God can't just overlook sin. He can't just sweep it under the rug because He's holy. And therefore, 
being holy, God knew that his sacrifice must be provided. As we think about the sacrifice, we might think, well, why Jesus? And this, remember, Jesus says, if it's at all possible, if there's any other way, can you take the cup from me? But apparently, there was no other way. So why is it? Why couldn't we offer ourselves as a sacrifice? Why is it that Jesus had to die? And there are at least two reasons for that. There are many more, but at least two. The first is this. It says in the Bible that a sacrifice has to be pure. A sacrifice has to be holy. And because we are sinners, because we have all added to that devastation and brokenness, we cannot possibly offer a sacrifice of ourselves. Jesus, the perfect spotless lamb, was the only one who could offer a sinless sacrifice to God. But there's another reason that it had to be Jesus, that Jesus was the only one. And that reason is this. It's because this transaction between God and man was a transaction that only Jesus could fulfill. As a man, he could stand in our place. But as God, he was the only one who could offer the price that was required. And you say, well, what is the price that was required? I want us to think about it like this. Think about it in terms of the offense and the nature of offense against God. You see, we oftentimes forget about the holiness of God. And because God is holy, an offense against Him is an infinite offense. And I want to give an illustration. I've given it before, but I want to give it again because it gives us a sense of the holiness of God and why a price had to be paid. I want you to think for a moment. Imagine for a moment that my brother walked in the room right now. My brother walks in the room and imagine he comes up to me and I haul off and I punch him in the face. My brother, he's a nice guy. He doesn't deserve to be punched. We can all agree that if I punched him in the face, I would deserve to be punished, right? That is sin, all right? Okay, now imagine that my sister walks in. My youngest sister, her name is Tori. Right now, she's quarantined in New York City. She's not about to walk in the room, but let's just imagine if she did, Tori walks in, okay? I haul off, I see her, and she's done nothing, but I pull back and mm, I punch her in the face. Now, we can see and we know punching my brother, that's bad, that's sin. But punching my sister, isn't there something in us that says, gosh, that's a little bit worse, All right, now imagine this. I've already punched my brother. I've already punched my sister. Now imagine my mom walks in the room. All right, my mom comes up. If you're watching today, hi, mom. I'm sorry to use you on this illustration. But imagine my mom walks up. I turn, I haul off, and I just punch her in the face. All right? Punching my brother, that's bad. Punching my sister, that's worse. But punching my mom? I mean, my mom gave birth to me. I owe her something. My mom is deserving of honor. The Bible says, honor your mother, father and mother. I should not punch my mother. That is worse. Punching my brother, bad. Punching my sister, that's worse. But punching my mom, somebody throw me in jail. All right? Let's go a step further. Punch my sister, punch my brother, punch my mom. Now let's imagine my grandma walks in. My grandma is a little bit over 80. She's been in her house uh, basically staying put for the last two weeks. Let's imagine she walked in. She's one of my favorite people on earth. I would never do this, but let's imagine it. She walks in and imagine she's done nothing, but I haul off and I just, I punch my grandma right in the face. At that point, Someone cut off my arms if I punch my grandma in the face. Punching my brother, that's bad, that's sin. Punching my sister, that's worse. Punching my mom, throw me in jail. But someone please stop me if I punch my grandmother. And there's something that we understand about that. And and as we think about that analogy, as simple and crude as it is, we know that my grandma is worthy of honor, that an offense against her is greater. Why? Because she's worthy of greater honor than my brother. It's a sin against my brother, but it's a greater sin against my grandma. Now imagine for a moment, my grandma is a sinner my grandma as much as i love her she is a sinner but imagine an offense against an infinitely holy god the bible says this in psalm 90 that god's anger is as great as the fear that is his due that god gave us life The very breath in our lungs is a gift from Him. That God has given us all good things to enjoy. That God loved us so much that He sent His Son to redeem us. And yet, what is sin? Sin is rebellion. Sin is looking at God and it's pulling back our fists. And it's saying, God, I want nothing to do with you. God, I don't want to have any part of you. That's what sin is. And listen, the same offense, punching my brother and punching my grandma, it's the same offense, but the difference is who I sin against. And the Bible says that when we sin against God because God is infinitely holy, it is an infinite offense. And an infinite offense requires an infinite payment. 
We owe God an infinite debt. Humanity in our sin cannot pay it. And yet, Christ came. He became a human. He left the throne of heaven. He left the glory. And He paid the cost of the cross. That His blood, because He was both God and man, was that infinite price. That His blood, because He was both God and man, was infinitely valuable. And the Son of God gave His life, acting on our behalf, giving us a sacrifice as human beings before God that God would accept and that would pay the debt that we could not pay. Nothing less than the infinitely valuable blood of the Son could atone for our sins. And yet when Jesus went to the cross, that's what He gave. When He spilled His blood, that's what flowed over us. So that even the worst and vilest offender would find grace at the cross. And the best part is this. The gospel isn't a story of an angry father taking his son and beating him. The gospel is a story of a loving father who knew that he could not deny his own holiness and he had to provide. And so he gave his son and the son willingly went and paid the price for us. See, the story of the gospel is a story of a family, a father who loved his rebellious children, a brother who loved his rebellious brothers and sisters. And so they enacted a plan, a plan of salvation that would come at great cost to them, but would would be offered freely to us. And so at the cross, we see this convergence of God and man. At the cross, we see this collision of mercy and grace that on the cross, the wrath of God was poured out. The Bible says that the sun went dark through the morning, symbolizing the fact that God punished His Son, that the wrath of God was poured out on His Son, that this holy aversion to sin, that the wrath of God, that He sees all sin, the wrath of God that's built up at all the agony, all the pain, all the devastation was poured out on Christ completely. And that every ounce of God's wrath was poured out on the Son so that we could be saved. That at the cross we see the mercy of God. At the cross we see the love of God. At the cross we see that God's very nature is satisfied. And yet His love is also put on display. That the cost of the cross reminds us not just of the holiness of God, but of His love. That the Father was willing to pay the price so that we could be saved. As we think about the Gospel, even though we were undeserving, God paid it all. The cause of the cross is our sin. The cost of the the cross is the blood of Christ Himself. But finally, I want us to think for a moment about the call of the cross. The call of the cross. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself and take up the cross and follow him. You see, the cross isn't just a moment. The cross isn't just a transaction where God provides the sacrifice needed. No, the cross for Christians is what we cling to as our way of life. That we come and die. That we take up our cross as a banner. That we take up our cross as a symbol. That we take up our cross as an identity. That we die to ourselves so that we can live for God. That just as Jesus died in obedience, we die. We die to ourselves. We die to our pride. We die to our sin. And we find in the cross the call of freedom. That in the cross, our chains are gone. That in the cross, we're lifted out of the pit. That in the cross, we have new life, a new name, a new hope. That all things are made new. Why? Because someone died. Because Jesus died for us. And so the cross, we look at the cross and we weep. We look at the cross and we mourn. And yet, we look at the cross and we find our life. That in the cross, the love of God is displayed. In the cross, we are shown our true value in God's eyes. That in the cross, God gave everything so that we could know Him and follow Him. The call of the cross is a call for us to come and die and follow after Jesus. 
What greater love than this? That a man would lay down his life for his friends. And church, as we look forward to Easter, we will celebrate. But we will celebrate because Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Sometimes we get caught in the trap of thinking that we could add to the sacrifice of Christ. That somehow what we do, our obedience, our works, could somehow add to what Christ has done. But I want you to think about what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2. He says, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That God gave himself for you. That God gave himself for me. That God gave himself for everyone. And Paul says this, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself up for me. Why? Because if we could add anything to the cross, if our works could add anything, if we could do anything to add to it, then Christ died for nothing. Church, we cannot fall into the trap of thinking that our meager, our feeble good works could add to the blood of Jesus. What greater lie is there than that we could add to what Christ has done, that on the cross he said, it is finished. We can't add to it. We can't earn God's favor. There's nothing we could do to add to what Jesus has already done. And clothed in the cross, clothed in the blood of Christ, the Bible says that we can go before the throne of grace with confidence. The call of the cross is the call to lay down our works, to lay down what we think makes us right in God's eyes, and to trust only and completely in the finished work of Christ. So if you're listening today and you're not a believer, I want you to hear the call of the cross. I want you to see the love of God displayed, that a holy, love, a holy God satisfied his own requirement for justice by punishing his son in your place. He died for you so that you could have life, and he's calling you today. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to turn from your sin. He wants you to see Christ and to love him and to cling to him and to cherish him and to follow him and to take up your cross as an act of obedience, an act that shows, God, I don't want to follow my own path. I want to follow you. The call of the cross for you today is a call to come and die that you may find life. And listen, for you who are listening today and you're a believer, the call is the same. That today you would remember that all that God required, He has provided. That the blood of Christ speaks a better word than anything you could ever do, that any offering you could ever give. The Bible says that the blood of Christ pleases God and that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ Himself. The call of the cross is a call to die to ourself and live to the One who gave it all for us. This is the amazing love of God. So as we go into this week, it's amazing, isn't it, that we call it Good Friday. It's not a Friday where we grieve. It's not a Friday. Where we forget. But it's a Friday where we remember that love for God and love for us drove Jesus to pay the price. And as we think about it, let's reflect on our sin. And then let's celebrate that that sin is paid for. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let's hear the call of the cross. And let's take up our own and follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Father, thank you for your great love. Father, thank you that even while we were still sinners, you died for us. Lord, thank you for the great love that spanned the gulf between heaven and earth. 
to find us, to redeem us, and to transform us. So Lord, help us to walk in the power of your Spirit and the love that you've given. Lord, help us to hear the call of the cross. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us once again at Heritage Baptist Church. We trust that you've been encouraged by hearing the word and that you're ready to follow the call of the cross. Once again, we want to encourage you to continue to give. You can do that by going to hbclebanon.com, clicking on the Give tab in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, and we just want to encourage you to continue to support the ministries of the church through your giving. You can also send a check to P.O. Box 685 here in Lebanon. Once again, we want to remind you that Easter is next Sunday. We're going to celebrate the risen Christ. And just because we're not in the church building doesn't mean that Easter is not going to happen. So we want to invite you to join us next Sunday for Easter Sunday. Thanks again for joining us. I think lunch is ready. Have a great rest of the day.